What's going on guys? In this review, I'm going to be breaking down episode 14 of Attack on Titan Season 4, in which Eren beat the shit out of Armin, and Zeke summoned a Titan army to kill Levi. As many of you know, the official release of this episode was delayed last week due to an earthquake, which meant that episodes 14 and 15 came out today instead. Today I'll be talking about the parts from episode 14 that I felt needed explaining, including why Eren said he hated Mikasa, Block's descent into madness, and why Levi's plan to have Zeke eaten makes no sense. Before we get into it, remember that the season finale of Attack on Titan is coming next week, so if you want to watch it as soon as it's available, then go to crunchyroll.com slash turtlequirk. That link will get you a two-week free trial of Crunchyroll Premium, where next weekend you can watch both the finale of Attack on Titan and the premiere of My Hero Academia just hours after they air in Japan. All episodes are in HD and professionally subtitled, so take it from me, Crunchyroll is the best place to check these series out, not to mention it also supports the anime industry. Thanks to them for sponsoring this video, and be sure to get your free trial by going to crunchyroll.com slash turtlequirk. Link is in the description. Okay, so episode 14 was called Savagery, which is possibly the most perfect title of the season, given just how many savages were in this episode alone. Following on from his absurdly casual entrance, Eren sits down to have a chat with Armin, Mikasa, and also Gabi because she just happens to be there. These guys haven't had a proper conversation since before he went to infiltrate Marley by himself, so this meeting is a way for them to catch up. Despite claiming it was going to be a peaceful discussion, from the beginning Eren made everyone keep their hands on the table whilst his hand was cut, meaning he could turn into a titan at any time. With the power of the Warhammer, he is able to use the power of the titans in enclosed spaces, and we saw this in the manga when he escaped from prison. That makes this scenario more similar to a hostage situation than a quiet chat, as clearly Eren knew things would turn ugly from the start. Throughout this season so far, characters have speculated that Eren is being controlled by Zeke, but here he rejects that notion and declares he is a free man who is acting of his own free will. We know this is true based on what we saw in episode 15, as we can see that he's not being controlled by Zeke, but rather he's just going along with Zeke's plan voluntarily. I'll be talking about this more in my review of episode 15 itself, but to summarize it here, Eren and Zeke's plan is to stop aliens from reproducing, and they can only do this once they make contact, because then Eren can use the power of the founding titan. This will gradually end the Eldian race without the need for conflict, but in order to fulfill that plan, Eren has to do certain things he doesn't want to do. This tough conversation is one of those things, and I'll explain why he's being so rude to Armin and Mikasa later in this video. Anyway, he reveals to the group that he spoke to Zeke whilst undercover in Mali, and from that discussion he learned many things about the Ackerman clan, and also how Bertolt's memories might be affecting Armin. Starting with the Ackerman stuff, because that's more interesting, Eren claims the reason Mikasa is so strong is due to the Ackermans being a genetically modified bloodline. Mikasa's powers activated the day she killed that kidnapper, and it was Eren that caused it to happen. His command telling Mikasa to fight sent a surge of electricity through her body, and it was clear that she instantly became stronger in that moment. Ordinarily, you'd think being a super soldier is a good thing, but Eren's problem is that Mikasa's desire to protect him is due to her Ackerman blood. In the same way that Ackermans of the past would protect the king, Mikasa's genetics are supposedly wired to protect Eren because he is the one that activated her powers. In other words, her attachment towards him all these years has not been out of free will, but rather she's being controlled by her DNA. He puts this theory to the test in a ridiculous way by intentionally saying things to provoke Armin and Mikasa. The point he's trying to make here is that even though he's saying things to make her retaliate, she is still genetically unable to attack him. The most shocking part was when he looks her dead in the eyes and says that he's always hated her ever since they were kids. It was honestly such an insane sentence to see coming out of Eren's mouth, but if we take a look back through the series, it's obvious that he's lying. You don't punch a titan with your bare hands to protect someone you hate. That's just not something people do. So I think that this image alone is enough to prove that, you know, he's, he's clearly not always hated her. The question then becomes, what does he gain from lying to his friends and insulting them? And to me, the most logical reason is that Eren is trying to push them away. Eren knows his friends will not support what he's planning to do, and so by pushing them away, he is strengthening his own resolve to follow through with it. Think about it, if they were all still friends, then maybe these two could convince him to take a different path. So by making sure they're on bad terms, Eren now has no one holding him back. I believe that's why he also insulted Armin, but before we talk about that, I want to mention something that Pixie said a few episodes ago. When previously talking to Yelena, the commander stated the best way to notice a good lie is when the person lying adds in a bit of truth. In Yelena's case, she told the truth that she met Eren, but Pixis knew she was lying about what they discussed. In Zeke's case, he told the truth that his spinal fluid can turn Eldians into Titans, but lied when he said it would make people freeze up, and that lie ensured that nobody suspected the wine. When it comes to Eren now, yes he may have said a couple things that we know to be true, but most of what he's saying cannot be backed up by any reliable source, 
with a quick example being what he said about Mikasa's headaches. He claimed that these headaches are the result of Mikasa's true self trying to resist being controlled, but if that's true, why have we never heard of something similar from Kenny, Levi, or even Levi's great grandfather? I mean, that guy was spilling all the secrets. Like Pixis, we have to be skeptical when it comes to things said by leaders of this rebellion, because at this point they're just saying anything to get the advantage. Moving over to Armin, one truth that Eren correctly assumed was that he's still going to visit Annie in her Titan Crystal. The wording implies that Armin has been doing this for a while, and Eren thinks that Bertolt's memories are what's causing this behaviour. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter, since either way, it plays into Eren's tactic to distance himself from his friends and strengthen his resolve. I'm pretty sure it hasn't even been a full week since he relied on these guys to help him out during the Battle of Liberio, and during that battle he showed no hatred towards them at all. For him to then suddenly claim that Armin and Mikasa don't have free will, and that he hates people who don't have free will, yeah, it's obviously not genuine, and like I said, we know the reason why he's doing this. His continued mockery of Mikasa leads to Armin dishing out a colossal punch to the face, but the way he just takes it is hilarious. I feel like Eren is a person who is just going through the motions right now, which is part of the reason why he looks so tired, but that didn't stop him from still teaching Armin a lesson. He dodged the successive punches with basically no effort, and his brutality towards Armin was way more profound in animated form. Eren then tells his guards to take Gabi, Mikasa and Armin away, as all of them are going on a road trip to Shiganshina. We know from later in the episode that Shiganshina is likely where Eren and Zeke are meant to meet each other, as Zeke wonders if his brother still remembers the place they agreed. Assuming that Eren does remember the location that Zeke's referring to, then him heading to Shiganshina is a bit of a giveaway. Speaking of Zeke, the anime then switches over to the forest where he's being held hostage, as Levi prepares to start cutting him up. To summarise Levi's thought process here, he doesn't want the military to eat Eren like Pixis is planning to do, but rather, he wants to fulfil his promise to Erwin by feeding the Beast Titan to someone instead. This idea from Levi is just terrible, because if the Beast Titan is given to someone without real blood, then the Island of Paradise is screwed. Zeke's royal blooded Titan is the key that will allow Eren to use the Founding Titan. If Eren can't use the Founding Titan, then that means he can't activate the rumbling. And if he can't do that, then Parody's Island will be helpless if the world launches a revenge attack on the island. Just for those of you that might not be sure what the rumbling actually is, essentially with the power of the Founding Titan, Eren can release the Colossus Titans within the walls of Paradis, and if they were to use it, then other nations would most likely back off. Historia is the only other person of royal blood who can inherit the Beast Titan, and right now she's pregnant so she can't do it, and who knows, maybe there will be complications, maybe she'll die during pregnancy, we just don't know, so it's not a risk worth taking. In my opinion, Levi's judgement is clouded by his desire to fulfil that promise to Erwin, and this is a rare example of him prioritising his own emotions over the survival of Eldians on Paradis. While Zeke was rereading his book, he was already subtly getting ready for his escape, as he checks with Levi if there's any wine left. This was his way of confirming that all of the soldiers have been contaminated with spinal fluid, meaning he can turn all 30 of them into pure titans. After a quick stretch, Zeke absolutely legs it while screaming at the top of his lungs. Zeke's scream turned all of Levi's men into pure titans, while everyone else on Paradise who drank the wine felt a surge of electricity through their body. People like Falco and Pixis were all contaminated, but on this occasion they weren't titanized because they aren't within range of Zeke's scream. In the past, Zeke has created pure titans that pretty much act like we expect, but in this situation they are all definitely abnormals. They're incredibly fast and can climb up the trees, which would have made this an impossible situation to survive for anyone else other than Captain Levi. However, it does go without saying that Levi still doesn't want to kill his soldiers, but when backed into a corner, he is more than able to do so. This shot right here was my favourite of the episode, because the absolute chaos of the pure titans is nicely contrasted by the composure and stoicism of Levi. Anyhow, given that Zeke controls the pure titans he creates, he uses one of them to hitch a ride, while the other two remain there as backup. His goal was to exit the forest and meet Eren at the location they agreed, but what he wasn't counting on was that God Mode Levi had already dealt with the other titans. From the moment Zeke was forced to turn into the beast, there are a few reasons why he never stood a chance. Number one, although the beast titan is technically a monkey, Zeke himself is not capable of climbing trees or swinging in any way which meant he was stuck on the ground while Levi was free to manoeuvre around him. Levi could therefore hide behind trees to evade whatever Zeke threw at him, and he obscured Zeke's vision by hiding behind the branches he chopped off. Additionally, there were no rocks in the area, so the beast desperately resorted to throwing titan brains and other unsavoury body parts. The way he just tore it apart like a nothing piece of meat, it was kind of funny to see that, but unfortunately it doesn't pack the same punch as what he normally throws. Overall, Levi was in control of this fight from start to finish, and his thunder spears were enough to pierce the beast titan's nape in one go. 
When these two fought back in Shiganshina, the captain was so fast that Zeke didn't have time to harden his nape. So it's ironic that this time around, Zeke did manage to harden it, but it just didn't mean anything. With the Thunder Spears detonating, the oldest Jaeger brother was turned into a mushy human barely hanging on to life, and in this state Levi is ready to serve him up to anyone who's prepared to eat him. One thing worth pointing out is that in the manga, it was confirmed that the Survey Corps newbies are the ones who gave Levi's soldiers the wine. Survey Corps recruits had already planted the bomb that killed Zachary and leaked government info about Eren, so this is yet another crime that we can add to their list. Most of the Survey Corps recruits want the Jaegerists to seize power because the existing military leadership has failed to adapt with the times. We see this in the following scene, where Instructor Shadis insists that all the new recruits learn about killing titans, despite the island's main threat now coming from humans on the outside world. It is fair to believe that his way of thinking is outdated, and we can tell that a lot of the new recruits did not have faith in him. Keith heard the comment that one of them made, and if you're familiar with his backstory, then you'll know why those words seem to disappoint him so much. For those that might not know, Keith Shaddis was the old commander of the Survey Corps. During his time as commander, he failed to get any significant results and he would often be the only one to survive expeditions. One day he came to the realization that while special people like Erwin do exist in the world, Keith himself was not one of them and became the first commander in the history of the Survey Corps to resign rather than being killed by a titan. To have a backstory like that, it must hurt when even as a mere instructor, the newbies think someone else should be in charge. The Jaegerists then make a grand entrance, and in keeping with his new villainous persona, Flock immediately fires a warning shot. His goal in coming here was to recruit Survey Corps newbies to join the Jaegerists, and this was a quick detour they were taking before Hanji brings them to Zeke. When some of the recruits began to switch allegiance and join the Jaegerists, Flock confirmed that he is now mentally insane by ordering the newbies to beat up Instructor Shardis. This was his twisted way of testing their resolve, but if you wanted to, I'm sure there's like a hundred less sadistic methods of doing this. You could tell that even the Survey Corps recruits were like, what the hell are we getting ourselves into? But they did obviously still go ahead with it. I would go as far as to say that Flock is the character with the most drastic personality change since Season 3. I mean, he never showed even a hint of this attitude beforehand. In fact, he was more witty than most Survey Corps members out there. At least when it came to Eren, you know, his attack on Marley wasn't that surprising. I mean, yeah, he killed women and children, so that is a bit out of character. But still, he's always had that destructive, revenge-filled mindset, so it wasn't too surprising. Whereas with Flock, it is just like, where did this come from? Back outside the forest, Levi holds Zeke hostage in a genius way, because if he moves his neck, then this cable would detonate a thunder spear in his stomach. Even for a titan shifter, that would probably kill them, so the beast titan is in a really tough situation. He continues to get tortured by Levi, and strictly speaking, the reason Levi is doing this is so that Zeke doesn't regenerate and therefore, you know, have the ability to transform. But being real, Levi probably wanted to do this anyway. Zeke wonders where his iconic glasses have gone, and a flashback takes us back into his childhood where we see a young Zeke playing catch with one of Marley's warriors. This guy was the former Beast Titan, but I will be talking about that more in my review of episode 15, as that episode just had the whole thing, whereas for this episode, you know, this is all we got. Be sure to hit that sub button so you don't miss the video on episode 15, and like I said, if you want to watch the season finale as soon as it drops, then click the link in my description to get your two-week Crunchyroll free trial. It's what I've used to watch the entire season so far, and also what I'll be using to watch My Hero Season 5, so I do recommend checking it out. Thanks for watching as always, and until the next one, peace out.